Coming up in the show, guest presenter and all-round car nerd John Quirk tests out the new electric Mini E. And I fulfil a lifelong ambition of racing a Ferrari. Hello and welcome to Fifth Gear Web TV, possibly the best car show on the net. First up in a radical change to the Who Does What schedule, here's Graham with the news. There's been a flurry of supercar news this week, starting with the release of the Zenvo ST1, the first ever supercar from Denmark. It's powered by a 7-litre supercharged and turbocharged V8 and produces 1104 brake horsepower and 1055-ish pounds-feet of torque, which makes it more powerful than a Bugatti Veyron. Unfortunately, however, because it's rear-wheel drive as opposed to the Bugatti's four-wheel drive, it's slightly slower than the Veyron's 60 miles an hour, taking three seconds as opposed to the Veyron's two and a half. Zenvo will put the ST1 into production next year and are keen to point out that it's an all Danish design. So we won't mention the fact that the V8 is sort of based on a Corvette ZL1 and we won't mention that the dials in there look a little bit similar to Porsche dials. They'll initially make just 15 cars and they've all been sold for 850,000 euros. That is Lee Noble, founder of Noble Automotive. He's left Noble now and he started a new company called Phoenix. Phoenix say that they're going to release one of the most dramatic supercars of the century, but we don't have any pictures of it because it doesn't exist yet. Lee says it will cost less than 75 grand, be aimed at serious track drivers and do 0 to 100 in less than 7 seconds, which sounds a little bit like one of them, the Noble M12 that he used to make. We also know that the car will have a V8, two seats and aims to be on the market by the end of 2010. Away from the supercars, BMW have released a new 5 Series and that is what it looks like. It goes on sale in March 2010 and comes with three diesel and four petrol engines. The range kicks off with a £28,000 520D, which has got 184 brake horsepower, and goes all the way up to a 50 grand 550i, which has got 407 horsepower and comes with a V8. A new M5 will come later and will be the first version that isn't naturally aspirated because it's going to be fitted with the twin turbo V8 from the X6 and X5M, so expect at least 550 brake horsepower. There's a big emphasis on zero emissions these days, so Fifth Gear Web TV decided to take a break from the fast and showy stuff and try out an electric car. <laughs> I was busy that day, so I handed things over to our new chum, John. You can tell the world's gone a bit eco car balmy because there are now more electric cars on our roads than there are Pagani Zondas. There are 1,500 of these things that usually fall into two camps. Super expensive, like the Tesla Roadster, or super dweeby looking like the G Wiz, with a range that wouldn't even get you around two London marathons. But now there's this, the Goldilocks of electric cars. Not too flash, not too flimsy, just right. The silly graphics reveal that this is a Mini E. And because it's based on a real car, it comes with useful things like crumple zones and end cap ratings and proper switch gear. And radically for an EV, it looks good too. You can't actually buy one of these yet. Right now, Mini is leasing a few of these prototypes to potential customers for a six month trial. And if feedback is good and tweaks can be made and any little problems ironed out and some sort of sub one series BMW will be then made in its place. So I guess that'll make it a naught series. There's no exhaust pipe round the back and if you come round the front, there's also no engine. Turning the front wheels here is a 150 kilowatt motor which is driven by a set of lithium ion batteries. Now this produces the equivalent of 201 brake horsepower which means that this mini milk float is more powerful than a Cooper S. Result. But battery power comes with its drawbacks. Two large cooling fans for the bulky battery means there's no rear seats so you can only impress one mate at a time. The first thing you notice when driving any electric car is just how good the pickup is from absolutely nothing. Watch this. That is absolutely ridiculous, we're at 60 already. I mean, 162 pounds foot of torque might not sound that much, but when you've got access to it immediately at the touch of your right pedal, that's when the acceleration becomes really, really brisk. The 0 to 62 time of this car is eight and a half seconds, which is half a second faster than a Cooper. They should have called this the Cooper E. Because it's only got one speed, it's basically an automatic, which means your dog could drive it. 
It's also got a much longer rev range as well compared to a normal car. I mean, in this thing, you've got 12,000 RPM to play with. It's still a properly well-built mini cabin as you'd expect inside, but there are a few changes like up front where your rev gauge used to be, you've now got your electric juice meter. Then where the old fuel gauge used to be, there's now that series of fluctuating orange bars which measure the car's energy consumption rate. So if I go on the gas, you can see all the orange bars rise above the fold. But then when I come off the gas, you can see the bars dropping. And you can actually feel there's quite a lot of engine braking going on with the car and that's basically regenerating energy. So I'm creating energy as we're still rolling along. The only strange thing about driving the E is the sound, or lack of it. Occasionally those fans may kick up a bit of fuss in the back, particularly if you drive aggressively. But apart from that, all you get is this eerie whoosh of road noise. So it might not sound like a hot hatch or a cold hatch, but fortunately it's still got the precise steering feel of any other Mini. And despite using the same fuel as my laptop, it's still really good fun to chuck around in the corners. But you definitely can feel the extra weight. I mean, this car's packing an extra 260 kilos over a regular Mini. But the real test of an electric car is its range. The G-Wiz, which looks like this, remember, is the most popular Lecky car on sale today. And that manages a pitiful 48 miles, or 75 miles if you manage to stump up an extra seven grand for the new lithium-ion version. The Mini E, though, has a claimed theoretical range of 156 miles under what BMW calls ideal conditions. That probably means still plugged in, but more realistically, you're probably going to get 104 miles on a juice up, which means if you live in London, you'll be able to get to Leicester without fueling. But if you wanted to get to Edinburgh, that'll take you four charges. A full recharge takes four and a half hours. So basically, you've got to treat the car like a mobile phone. Use it by day, charge it by night. It's practical, safe and desirable, which makes it just about the best electric car out there. But two seats in a 100 mile range isn't going to work for everybody. There's also going to need to be some serious infrastructure in place in order for electric cars to be a credible long term proposition. In the meantime, I think I prefer my clean kicks in a Cooper D. Now, after a very long wait of more than two decades, I finally got to race a Ferrari, making a lifelong dream come true. It was all very exciting, and here's how I got on. Welcome to Brands Hatch in Kent, where I will be competing in the final round of the GT Cup, which is basically a racing series for supercars, and I will be driving something rather special. Today's race will be a 25-minute battle on the short indie circuit, with almost 30 cars fighting for the same bit of tarmac. And I'll be racing this, a Ferrari F430 that's based on the Challenge racing car, but with more aerodynamics. It's got a massive carbon fibre rear wing and front splitter and some trick suspension. It's also got a 4.3 litre V8 engine with 495 bhp. It's been my childhood ambition to race a Ferrari and finally it's arrived. Now I qualified yesterday in the wet and I finished second in class and sixth overall in a field of 26. I'm really pleased with that. I'm now about one hour away from the race. I've got butterflies and I need the room. The GT Cup Series is now in its third year and it's designed for non-paid racing drivers. There are four different classes within the field split by each car's power and weight. I was in class two with other Ferraris and 911 GT3s. And after a driver's briefing, the teams made their final checks and I prepared to take my place on the grid. This is probably the worst bit, I think. A, because I'm looking terribly unattractive in my balaclava. <laughs> but uh, it's just the, the tension and the nerves, really, now. So the rolling start, ooh, I had to get as close to the rear of the Lotus in front of me as possible. I was almost kissing it. I was looking up, waiting for the red lights to disappear, and as soon as they disappeared, we were racing. I moved to the right-hand side and just got the legs on the Morgan that had started beside me, but into the hairpin, he took the place back. I kept my foot in, it was getting hot. The noise of the car was just wonderful. And the steering was great, the slick racing tyres, they were getting hot, so I had a nice bit of cornering grips, which gave me a lot of confidence. 
It was fantastic to finally be racing a Ferrari. After a few laps, I was still holding my position of second in class. But I was soon in a bitter battle with a yellow Porsche and lap after lap I kept him at bay. At the halfway stage as I was about to lap a BMW Z4, Mr Porsche got a bit too keen and hit me in the door. I was going like that, all of a sudden I went 90 degrees that way. And fortunately he kept hitting me so much I went back in a straight line. <laughs> Blinked a bit, kicked down some gears and powered on again. He, the yellow Porsche, broke his uh, alloy wheel in the process so he didn't finish. I'd slipped back to third in class and as I continued, others were not so lucky. I was back in second place. The only car I needed to beat was my teammate in an identical red Ferrari F430. But after my setback with the Porsche, the distance between us was just too much to crawl back. And as the chequered flag fell, a second place in my first ever Ferrari race was enough for me. Crossed the finish line, saw that I was P2, knew that I'd got a trophy in the bag, which is here. I pulled in to congratulate the team, but the door wouldn't open. It's all right, don't worry. My bump with the Porsche had dented it severely, but thankfully there was a crowbar to hand. Yeah, open up. Come on. Yeah. What a day, my first ever Ferrari race. My first ever Ferrari trophy. That's it for this edition of Fifth Gear Web TV. We'll be back for some more net-based car fun in a fortnight.